You're quite a girl. You know, it's a funny thing. When I walked in here a few minutes ago, I, I felt kind of sorry for you. Why? Oh, I don't know. Having to work your way through school, missing a lot of good times, and, well, not having the best things in life. The best things in life, I've got them. Everybody has. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. to ticklish business i'm kristen lopez joined as always by emily edwards while samantha ellis is living her best pre-wedding life emily how are you so good this is going to be a fun one it is going to be a one i don't know if it'll be fun or good even though the title implies that it is but it's technically my birthday episode as we all know if you've been listening long enough i picked the movie on my birthday and i decided to pick a frothy Peter Lawford-centric movie musical for today. We are talking about 1947's Good News. And to help us discuss the good news of this film is a man who knows his musicals like the back of his hand, Schmigadoon creator Cinco Paul. How are you, Cinco? It's always great to see you, but it's even better to have you on the podcast talking musicals. I know. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And if you have not watched Shameless Plug for your show, Shemigadoon, you know musicals. I've watched both seasons of the show and find new musical references. Is good news a reference in either of the seasons? No. (laughs) No surprise there. It is not, but I will tell you that I did look at several of the musical numbers, particularly past that peace pipe. As we were ramping up this season, I was thinking about things to play with and do. You know, obviously, this the Technicolor look of this and the way it's shot is very much what we wanted to emulate in season one of Schmigadoon. I was toying around with the idea of playing with the cultural appropriation of the fascination with Native Americans. And at that time, it was also Hawaii they were fascinated. And the way anything exotic, they would usually, there'd be a number in a musical that was dealing with that subject. And so I was looking, dancing around it, but never found a way to address past that peace pipe in Schmigadoon. Probably a a good idea. But anyway, we can talk about that number later. Season three idea. I'm waiting for some sort of weird past that peace pipe sequence with Ariana DeBose, Oscar winner (laughs) Ariana DeBose. But before we get into that, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, you should. We do additional bonus pods, including double features looking at remakes based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime. We just did an episode on the three dueling versions of the women. Yes, including the 2008 modernized remake. And Emily and I are prepping a whole mini series on literary classic adaptations. We also give out regular care packages and movies and gifts and let you guess on an episode. It is at patreon.com slash ticklish biz. And don't forget that Emily and I are both authors. You can order our respective books wherever you get books. And our new Redbubble store has some fabulous art, all designed by Terrence Hiltz and our own Samantha Ellis, featuring your favorite stars on all sorts of items, including our always popular Makoko the Pirate mugs. You can find that at ticklishbiz.redbubble.com. So to talk about good news, good news is the story of Tate College, a very nondescript college somewhere smack dab in the middle of America. You have the star-crossed love story of football star Tommy Marlowe, played by Peter Lawford, and Connie Lane, a quiet librarian, played by June Allison. There are all sorts of hijinks, including love triangles, French lessons, who will win the big game, why are all the women over 30? I'll talk about my thoughts on this movie in a second, but... I want to know, Cinco, when I brought this up to you, I was a little afraid because I know that it's not a big musical. It's not something that is well remembered. And you said that you definitely remember this movie. What's your background with this film? And why does it at least stick in people's memories? And I certainly hadn't seen it before I was doing my deep dive into Schmigadoon and research. So I think I really saw it as research as I was gathering up all these MGM musicals. And this was one, obviously, I'd seen the big ones. Compton and Green went on to write a much better musical, several better ones than this. 
So that was really it. Initially, I watched a couple of the musical numbers. And then at one point, I tried to watch the movie back then. I realized quickly the screenplay, the story, there's nothing to glean from this at all. It's just, let me skip to the musical numbers. And so really, that's my history with this movie. I revisited it for this. And yeah, I feel pretty much the same way. <laughs> The story is a mess. I hesitate to call it garbage. But one thing that's really interesting to me is I was curious. It's based on a Broadway show from the 20s. Every story decision they made to change it made it worse. It made it make less sense. And not that Broadway shows in the 20s had a lot of emphasis on story, but the story there made a little more sense than this. He's going to flunk French. If he flunks French, he can't play in the big game. But if he plays in the big game, somehow he has to marry this gold digging woman. That was the biggest stretch. That's the stake. It's interesting that in the initial show back in the 20s, he had written a drunken proposal as a letter to her. And so she had that and was holding him to it which made a lot more sense. And it wasn't based on whether he won the game or played in the game or not. I don't know if you two can make any sense out of that. So that at least made more sense. And then at the end, the Pat character steps away and realizes, oh, this is true love, which is very different. It gave her agency in the 20s that they took away in the 40s, which I guess makes sense in terms of the history of this country. That's my long diatribe about how little sense this story makes. You have to sort of set that aside if you want to enjoy the movie at all. That's why I enjoy the movie, because it is a guilty pleasure. It is garbage, as you hesitate to say, but I will say. It is definitely <laughs> a C-level musical. We would not be talking about it if it did not have a pretty face in it. One of my favorites, which we'll talk about Pete Lawford in a second. Oh, Emily Pete Lawford's your favorite. Oh, I'm a big Peter Lawford stan. Samantha, if she was here, would also agree with me. We put up with a lot of guff from Pete in his films because the man didn't make the best choices in life or on screen. Emily, I know you and I talked about this briefly last night, but what were your thoughts watching this for the first time? Well, it's a movie, all right, and it's <laughs> very dancey, and there's lots of singing, and I couldn't grasp if it's because I went to an artsy farts college that I couldn't understand the importance of football and why football was being played in the spring, because not the right time for that. They're like playing the big game, she's ring by spring, and also graduating all at the same time, and I was like, wow, everything happens all at once, You're and that was not my experience. The prom. Colleges had proms? I didn't know that. We didn't in my school, but weird arts college. So maybe I was just missing out on stuff. And really, I was watching it as someone who now writes books that take place in the 1950s. So this is close enough to that cultural zeitgeist of Americana. And I was like, wow, everything was so weird back then. We just come off of talking about the women, which is 1939, which is this really very progressive, woman forward, super powerful movie where these women are still dealing with marriage and all the repercussions of that. But this is not that at all. And it has a lot to say about ladies and none of it is kind. <laughs> it's one of those movies that once you start doing background research on it, you're like, oh, this is why it makes so much sense and why it's bad. This was originally planned as a Mickey and Judy movie, as a follow-up to Babes in Arms. That explains so much, because it does feel very much like a Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland movie. Let's put on a show. We're going to college. You can just see the characters swapped for the actors that it was originally envisioned for. And this was also really everybody except for the cast first time making a film. We've talked about Charles Walters before, most recently, about the high society. But this was really his directorial debut. He'd done a segment in Ziegfeld Follies, uncredited, but this was his first feature film. He would follow it up the next year with Peter Lawford again and do Easter Parade. And then from there, he would become a very great underrated musical director. But this is like first time out. Comden and Green, this was their first time writing a script for film. 
you can see people trying to dust off the cobwebs of how do I transition to this new medium? That being said, yeah, this is a guilty pleasure watch because it is just bananas dumb. We all know I hate June Allison. And <gasps> that does not change. I know. I know. Oh, She's a husband Kristen. stealer. She's a husband stealer. <laughs> well, I don't know her backstory or what she did when the cameras went off. I find her delightful and very charming. It's interesting that you mentioned Judy Garland because she's definitely a poor man's Judy Garland, if you want to say that. Certainly in this role, she inhabits, it's so clearly a Judy Garland role. A lot of her line deliveries even reminded me of Judy. I found her one of the more charming things about the movie. Those old girl next door types, and she has sort of that husky voice a little bit. I found her charming. I love that you love her because, yes, that's why we all love classic film. We all come at it from different places. So no judgment. I get what you're saying, though. A lot of these character choices or actor choices feel like discount versions, right? June definitely feels like a dollar store Judy Garland in this instance. The character of Pat, Patricia Marshall, is very much a true value Ann Miller. You can just see Ann Miller. And even... Peter Lawford, you can just see where they really probably could have gotten Gene Kelly and it would have worked better. And Ray McDonald is a poor man's Donald O'Connor. Yes. I mean, the two of them, when I saw the two of them with their ladies man number, I thought, oh, this would be amazing as a Gene Kelly, Donald O'Connor number. I thought Ray McDonald, I thought he was, was really fun. He was also a highlight of the movie for me. The Bobby, the actor. Yeah, Oof, yeah. He did a great he job. Was fun. That's what I appreciate about this movie is that classic filmdom, people forget that the collegiate genre was a genre unto itself. There are so many college movies. We don't get them today unless they're like direct to video sex comedies. We maybe had a little bit of that in the 90s, but we don't get the college genre as a genre anymore. And I mostly just forgive this movie because it's got Peter Lawford in sweater vests and high-waisted linen pants, trying really, really hard to dance sing. and sing. and sing, Which is so weird. His singing in this is so terrible. And yet, they realize his strengths, because Fellow with an Umbrella in Easter Parade works. It's a good use of his register. So I feel like this was trial and error. He can't do it. So if we're going to put him in a musical, we're going to have to make it a 40-second song, make sure that it's in a key that he can work with because the French song, as I call it, I don't remember any of these songs names. French um, lesson. That's a fun thing. You get to hear Peter Lawford speak French. He was fluent in it and June Allison was not. So he had to teach her how to say the words, which I love that as somebody who speaks Spanish, like a white girl, I'm like, Oh, she speaks French, like a chick that went to France for a summer it sounds very generic. And then Peter Lawford shows up as a fluent Frenchman. And you're like, oh, okay, that works. But he has no business singing. He's Rex Harrison level. But talk. that song, that which is a new song written for the movie by Comden and Green, is really clever. The lyrics are clever. And it plays to his singing ability. To me, that number was one of the highlights of the movie. It's actually a really good number staged right. They're both really charming. I don't know. I really like that number, but you're right. He should not be singing love songs to anybody. That plays to, like you said, his strengths. I am not a Peter Lawford. I just don't have a lot of knowledge about him. Buona Sera, Mrs. Campbell is one of my favorite movies of all time. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. That's the only on the Peter list. Lawford movie I really know. Small parts in Easter Parade in there. He's in there, yeah. I can give you recommends. He always played the second banana. He never got the girl, at least not the main girl. And or as the 50s progressed into the 60s, he would play the Englishy cad, which apparently was probably was in real life, pre and post marrying a Kennedy. There's that. Peter Lawford is the old Hollywood soft boy that I'm just like... The hair, the fact that he plays an American football hero with an English accent. He's like Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn never hid that accent. And you just rolled with it. Peter Lawford's the same way. Every time I watch this, I'm like, I love that there's a line where somebody says to him, all American, does that mean you become a citizen? And the joke is that she clearly doesn't know what that means. But the joke is always that 
I don't know if Peter Lawford was a citizen at this point. Right. I don't think he was. <laughs> I love the flirtation aspect of the French song and the repartee is really, really good. It just never hits the peak of love story that you expect from a movie musical. It's passionless in a way. And I know we brought this up to Kristen the last time I spoke with her. I'm going to jump ahead to the finale really fast because when the whole like, oh, we're finally going to get together moment happens, you expect this big sweeping romantic thing to happen. And they basically do a college fight song and peck on the cheek. I know this is peak haze period, but you're really going to show your love for one another through rooting for the football team. It's so not romantic. You and the varsity drag, Emily. I know. Golly. But but that song, that is the hit of the show. Although the best things in life are free. Those are the two big memorable numbers. But I also thought that was a mistake. Why are you ending with the big song, reprise it there, but they should have a big number in the middle of the movie that would have really helped. But I think to Emily's point, The Best Things in Life Are Free isn't a romantic song at all. It's a philosophical song. It's like that's kind of their love song, but it's not really romantic. But also just the story, the triangle is messed up in terms of it doesn't make any sense. Really after the French lesson and their whole Best Things in Life Are Free and they kiss, And then he says, wow, I'm really learning French. That'll work with Pat. (laughs) What sort of idiot does that? Even if he's feeling that, he would never say that in front of her. Things like that make it hard to root for. I will say the varsity drag number is great because it shows how inept Peter Lawford is at dancing. I told this to Emily earlier. He does a lot of elbow work in his performances. And I realized watching it this morning that the varsity drag number In musical performances, you need to have a level of sharpness. You can act like you don't know the moves, but you don't want to actually not know the moves. I never believe that Peter Lawford knows at all what he's doing. His handwork is just really uninspired. Either he did not care about filming this by this point, or he was just woefully inept. Because I watch him watch June Allison, and I'm getting less like he's looking at her in love and more like he is looking at her to try to figure out what the hell the dance moves are. He just does not have them. The only thing that's fortunate for Peter Lawford is that Mel Torme is a worse dancer. (laughs) Watching Mel Torme in that number, it's just like someone taught the moves to him that morning. He clearly could not care less. Better or worse than Natalie Wood in West Side Story. She's often the gold standard for bad dancer, which I think is a little unfair to Natalie. I think she does... Just fine with what she's given. Peter Lawford actually might be a worse dancer. (laughs) In terms of the storyline, I always realize very quickly why I don't watch this movie all the way through when I see it. I usually watch to the first half and then I just go on living my life because the second half, all of the kinetic energy from the constant songs totally disappears. After Past That Peace Pipe, which is oddly enough the crescendo of this movie, you still have an hour in order to tell the story. And I will say Joan McCracken was given this role. She had had a debut in Oklahoma, I think, on stage and got the role as Babe. I never really understood why she didn't become a thing because she's clearly very cute. She knows how to dance. She knows how to sing. And that number is Cinco, you're the expert as far as I'm concerned. It looks very complex in terms of the movements and the crane shots. It's a really, really impressive musical number. I see why it's often studied in musical theater classes and whatnot. And then everything just grinds to a halt. All the songs after that are really slow, if not present. And it always weirds me out that, why? Why would we do this? Why do we start really raw, raw, and then just be cool? We've already got your money. You have an hour left to watch these characters. There are lots of bad decisions throughout. But Past That Peace Pipe is an amazing musical number. It still holds up. It's really well done. Clearly, they put most of their effort into that number because even like Varsity Drag and the opening number, they're pretty static. It's just wide shots of the crowd and there's a little bit of camera. Movement. And he was a choreographer, right? The director. He really put all his effort into this completely unmotivated song. The Pat character gets a little angry and she's like, "Uh uh-oh, I better sing you a song to calm you down. A song about cultural appropriation. (laughs) It's like, what makes the red man red? Some of these 
songs now that it's in movies, numbers that are really great, but hard to watch for that reason. For me, one of the best songs in the movie was actually cut. Do you know about this cut song? I've heard that there was a song that was cut. Yeah, it's available online called An Easier Way. And it's a duet between June Allison and Patricia Marshall. Patricia Marshall. Compton and Green wrote the lyrics and they're really clever. It's a really good song about June Allison is saying there must be an easier way. And then the other girl, because she's gorgeous, is just saying there isn't an easier way. For me, it's really easy. It was just about an easier way to get a guy. Have you joined Ticklish Biz's Patreon? You should. Just like Allie Moore, Amy Hart, Andrew Hopp, Christine Meyer, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Jacob Haller, Jonathan Watkins, Krista Painter, and Mickette. Listen to episodes 48 hours early, receive exclusive membership items, and even guest on an episode. You can also get access to bonus series like Based on a True Podcast, Doubled Features, and our new upcoming limited series, But Have You Read The? It's all at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. When I watched it, I thought, oh, it's such a shame that this one got cut because it's really a clever number, but it's not a big rousing number. And looking at what outfits they were wearing, it took place very early in the movie and probably was just slowing things down too much. But encourage everybody to check that out. It's on YouTube. You can find it there. And I wish they had kept that because the Patricia Marshall character, an actress that, as far as I know, did not have a... A-list career. We never really understand who her character is. She does not speak French, as far as we know, which Peter Lawford never realizes the entire movie. He's speaking to her in perfect French and she never responds in kind. And he's just like, eh, that's normal. But also, she's just this stereotypical gold digger and giving her some background as to why she is that way in a song would have really helped make you at least sympathize more. Even with Ann Miller, who kind of plays the same type of character in Easter Parade, right? You still understand why she's throwing over Fred Astaire. It's because she wants her own career. And you don't have to belabor that point, but at least gives her some agency and some background that makes you feel for her. Kat in this movie is just like, eh, she's just a chick that wants to marry money, which Instead of letting her just go off with the wealthy guy that she was dating at the beginning of this film, there's this convoluted plot where they essentially hook her up with, because it's a college movie in 1947, a guy whose name is Beef. Yeah. We just lie to her and say, oh, he's got money and that's okay. Why, though? I'm assuming they need to do that so that we can break the love triangle that's going on between him and Babe and Bobby, which apparently is going to turn violent in some instance. But it makes no sense to any of the characters and is a massive plot hole. I really liked her. She's really pretty. She sings really well, which made... Initially, I was like, is that her voice? Because it seems like she might may have become a bigger star if that was actually her voice, because it's a really nice voice. I did a tiny bit of research, and apparently she was known as a singer, too. So that was her. It's really a shame she didn't get to do more of this. She's got a real Catherine Grayson vibe to her, Mm -hmm. which, interestingly enough, on the town and Anchors Away would come out relatively close after this. So, very sad. It's always sad when you see an actor and you're like, huh, why didn't that person hit... We mentioned Joan McCracken, who did not really become much of a star here in Hollywood. And even someone like Ray McDonald, after this, he did a couple films... He is uncredited as a dancer in Singing in the Rain. And then he did TV and just ended up not having a huge career and died at the age of 38 in 1959, which is really sad. His death is shrouded in mystery, apparently. Only in old Hollywood could you find somebody's death shrouded in mystery. Career is is shrouded in mystery. Exactly. He might have overdosed on sleeping pills, but his daughter says that that's not true, that he was preparing for other things. And apparently, the official tale is that he died, apparently, of something called visceral congestion, which is a fancy word for saying choking to death on food. And because there were sleeping pills in his room, many people thought it was a suicide, and the rumor just ended up being perpetuated. 
really sad bummer of an ending for Ray McDonald, who is very, very sweet and charming in this movie. He gets to be the football hero, even though Peter Lawford goes back into the game at a certain point. Yeah. He's the one that actually gives them all the points. Peter Lawford just saunters in and like, I don't know, football <laughs> does the last thing and then they win. <laughs> And Ray was running backwards. He was running towards the wrong goal. Then they spun him around and he scored. It was exciting. It reminded me of Lucas. The movie Lucas is one yeah. of my favorite movies, where the nerdy weakling gets a chance to shine in the game. Joan McCracken also died young. This is what's known as the good news curse. The pe- Apparently. <laughs> people in this movie, not only did their careers not last long. I wanted to circle back to beef because one of my notes while I was just writing and watching the movie is, Beef is terrifying. He's really, really scary. Not only is he obsessed with the psychology of just how come every single movie of this era had to crack at Freud, and it's really bizarre. It was an obsession. Yeah, it was like pop psychology or something was a big deal. Everyone has to go to their analyst between about 1928 and 1985. Apparently, everybody (laughs) was really into seeing their analyst. And Beef just did not take anyone's advice and was really, really scary and very possessive and violent towards vehicles. And that was a lot of red flags, many red flags as a golf course, that one. (laughs) Can we just say that Joan McCracken's character should have probably been killed in the backseat of that car when he threw the door on her head? That was my thought. In his defense, he didn't know she was there. (laughs) True, true. (laughs) Joan McCracken (laughs) did die early. She died in her early 40s of heart disease. And she, unlike the characters in this movie, was very unlucky in love. She was married uh, to Fosse, right? Yeah, she was Fosse's second wife. They were married from 52 to 59. She had complications of diabetes and died of a heart attack at the age of 43. But her first marriage, if memory serves, to Jack Dunphy also ended sad. I want to say that he left her for Truman Capote. I think that's what oh. I read somewhere. There's fun Hollywood fact. So she was not lucky in love, unfortunately. But this is still a firecracker performance from hers. It's a shame. That when you're dealing with Fosse, though, you got to be able to have a thick I mean, skin or something. She oh. ends past the peace pipe by dangling from a man's arms and eating ice cream. Okay, that's impressive. Yeah. Weird, but very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> the end of the musical numbers. I also really like the end of The Ladies' Man, where Peter Lawford, they go over the shrubs, then they quickly stand up and shake hands. Very yeah. creative. There's a lot of shrub drumping in this movie, actually. Every time he ends a conversation, he just like hippity hops over a little bush. And it's like, <laughs> show off your athleticism, adorable 24-year-old Peter Lawford. Good for you. The shrub jumping is a thing, which June Allison does fence jumping in the 49 version of Little Women, which also has Peter Lawford as my second favorite Lori. He also does what I have called Howard Keel leg, which is the tendency that classic film actors had back in the day to pop one leg onto a bench or a planter or something for reasons. It doesn't seem comfortable, but it's I'm assuming the 1940s peacocking. I'm not really clear. Howard Keel did it the best. Peter Lawford was 24 when he did this. He was a baby and the women were not. 24. Emily, you did the math. How old was everybody else? Pat Marshall was 23, so she's also collegiate-aged. June and Babe were both in their 30s. I believe they were both 30. So they were a little bit long in the tooth. I say this as an almost 40-year-old woman, but hard to pass off 30 as college. It's hard to pass off 30 as 21. It's a little bit of a stretch. June Allison, she felt like a grown woman in this, yeah, not a college girl. I give credit to cinematographer Charles Schoenbaum, who does, like Vincent Minnelli in something like Meet Me in St. Louis, does give the women... June Allison, I don't think, has ever looked as beautiful as she does in this movie. The soft lighting goes well with the blonde hair. Her makeup, unlike in The Opposite Sex, which we talked about, which was very severe, is not severe in it. So she looks... As youthful as I think we would have ever gotten. Speaking of Meet Me in St. Louis, I love that the fraternity house or wherever the dudes live is the Smith house that Judy Garland and her family lived in from Meet Me in St. Mm -hmm. Louis. As soon as they came out on that porch, I was like, aw, stop reminding me of a better musical. A musical that's 
better in every single way. So much better. (laughs) So much better. We've already talked about the finale, but the last 30 minutes, I think, is where Comden and Green just gave up on the script because it literally culminates with he has to pass French. He has to get married, which I wish they kept the drunken scribbling because it would have at least made sense to explain why he would have to go through with the marriage. I'm like, you can just tell her you've changed your mind. By not having that element, it just kept making me say, oh, so Peter Lawford doesn't have to do anything bad. He doesn't have to disappoint anybody. If he fails French, then he has an excuse so that he doesn't have to get married. If he does this, there's no confrontation element, which usually is pretty standard in these types of musicals. There's a moment where the character has to go confront the other woman and say, you're not meant for me. Schmigadoon does it well. It doesn't have that at all in this movie. All of these people at one point could just talk to each other and we could have solved this very easily. I actually almost go back around to commending Comden and Green for making the plot so convoluted that it turns itself around and weirdly is impressive that it's so convoluted in order to circumvent a very simple thing. Having spent a career as a writer and knowing how smart Comden and Green are, I feel like they were noted to death on this or something, and then they just gave up. I've been at this point on movies, too, where the people up above said, like, no one's going to care. And I would make my points, but this doesn't make any sense. You're overthinking it. You hear a lot from studio execs. No, no, you're overthinking it. And I'm sure that's what they were told. We saw him do a whole musical number where he demonstrated a lot of ability in French. How is he possibly going to fail out of this class? He's obsessed with French. He does this whole number. Makes no sense. I mean, he's the savant almost, the way the movie plays it. They had to make it convoluted for one reason, and it's a little bit off color, which is that they had to make the girl leave him for beef so she didn't, air quotes, have to get married to him. It had to be her Uh, leaving him to maybe show that there wasn't a reason why they had to get married immediately as soon as they graduated college. But that might just be my cynical 2023 brain (laughs) looking at things. Can I point out with the beef thing, my favorite moment in this whole movie is a moment where June Allison breaks. Did you notice it? When she's with the sorority house matron and she's given her the script to read, Watch it. There's a mm-hmm. moment, there's a line she's talking about beef. It says, have you seen that new car, our car of his? And she breaks. And it's really delightful because something, the other actress was so committed that it was making her laugh. And you can see hints of it a little earlier, like she's holding it in. And then in that moment, she just breaks out and just laughs. It's so adorable. It made me like her even more because I don't know about her stealing husbands. So... I'm setting that aside and saying... He did. (laughs) The best joke in the whole thing is explaining that he's no longer the pickle king because there was a cucumber blight in Iowa, and I (laughs) lost it there. So I might have been laughing and missed where she broke, but that whole bit was pretty darn funny. That was pretty funny. (laughs) Yeah, and it was clever that she wrote this whole script. Good for her. That was good for her character. I love that she pretty much proved that she could be a screenwriter if, if working at the library ended up not working out because she cobbled together a script in about 30 seconds. That makes more sense than the one in the movie. Although I do laugh. I feel like there is some sort of crass in-joke to naming Peter Lawford's backstory as he's the fake heir of a pickle kingdom. Like, I feel like that might be a double entendre, but I don't know if the movie's that smart in order to do that or if I just have a smutty mind. It could be both. Probably both. Charles Walter's Again, very underrated director. We talked about that when we talked about High Society, which is another I love. I love High Society. Then you should definitely not listen to our episode where it's two of us who do not like it and one of us who absolutely adores it and the one who loves it is not here right now. (laughs) On my podcast with my writing partner, Ken, we make each other watch movies and discuss them. I made him watch High Society and he hated it. Obviously, it's far inferior to Philadelphia story, but I like the songs. Love Grace Kelly, beautiful and wonderful. Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra are so cool. A lot of it has to do with when you see these movies. I saw it when I was 12 or 13 and just thought, oh, this is the greatest 
now you has jazz is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. Not to spoil the episode, which is not out yet, but we mostly agreed that Emily and I both saw Philadelphia Story first. So that probably yeah. colored things. But I also want to show for another Charles Walters movie. I mentioned it in the High Society episode, but Dangerous When Wet, Esther Williams. Oh, if you have that. not seen any of his Esther Williams films, you are in for a treat because they make about as much sense as this movie, but they are better written with more chemistry and Dangerous When Wet. Got really great songs that are very similar. Lucky in Love in this film sounds a lot like Got Out of Bed on the Right Side, which is from Dangerous When Wet. And it's just a lot of fun. Maybe next birthday, that'll be my movie that I talk about. I want to give a shout out to one of my favorite velvet crooners of all time, who's actually Mel Torme and in this movie. And if you are on the younger side and just learned about people like Tony Bennett from his passing and give Mel Torme a chance, man, he has such a gorgeous voice, not a hoofer, but just a beautiful, beautiful singing voice. Find some of his albums, find some of his jazz standards stunning 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 singers that was my big takeaway of this because i didn't know he was in movies i just knew him as a jazz crooner singer and my parents the had all Velvet the albums and I listening to him if you want to relax just listen to mel torme for a little while i was happy to see a very 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 young mel torme play a ukulele in yeah, this movie. and he's actually and playing it shout out to the costumes helen rose did the women's fashions in this which Remember, this movie is set in 1927. We didn't talk about that. The fashions, at least for the women, are not at all period authentic. And I wonder how much of that is Hayes Code indicative because Patricia Marshall has on one straight A-line flapper dress at one point, but it's very boxy looking because the straps are super thick. It's got no shape to it. It's just a gunny sack. June Allison's wardrobe is almost exclusively 50s puff sleeve, soon to be 50s is 47, puff sleeves, cinched waist. It's not at all period specific, but the men's costumes are credited to someone Val? in the email. Val, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe, who did a lot of really great costumes for men, including Madame Bovary and Easter Parade. So he clearly knew how to dress Peter Lawford, but the men's fashions are great. A lot of bow ties, a lot of linen. I'm assuming they were sweating and all of those things. A lot of wool. They're period specific, Emily, as you mentioned, and the women are just not dressed at all that way. They nailed men's leisure wear through and through with the football helmets, wool, everything. It must have been miserable. If you ever want me to go into the history of fashion, they nailed the men's wear. But holy golly, were all of those women's, it was all wrong. It was all wrong. It was actually distracting as someone who really likes historical fashion. None of that was correct for what was happening just before the Depression happened. You're overthinking, Emily. (laughs) No. (laughs) I'm sure someone raised that and was like, oh, no. Nobody's watching that for period specificity in 1947. Overall, Good News is definitely not A or B level musical, but... If you're looking for a way into Peter Lawford's films, as I recommend all people should, he is an actor that could have only existed in 1947. It's definitely a movie that could have only existed in 47. It's weird. It's weird. And that's, I think, part of the charm. Emily, final thoughts on Good News? It must have been a butts in the seats, might as well go see a movie kind of movie. Good for them. I hope it made some money. I hope it didn't cost them lots of money. It didn't look like it did. Mel Torme. It did not make a lot of money, actually. It was a box office disappointment. So there's that. A disappointment in every way. Cinco, take us out. Final thoughts on good news. Like a lot of these MGM musicals, the way to get the most out of them is maybe to search for the musical numbers on YouTube. <laughs> look for Pass That Peace Pipe. Look for an easier way. Maybe just search some of the musical numbers and watch them. The French lesson one is really charming. So I think search out some of those musical numbers. That's really what these are all about. And it has several that are not all timers, but are charming and fairly well done. Take it in little bits and pieces. Listeners, you can email your thoughts to us at ticklishbiz at gmail.com, or we are on all social media at either at ticklishbiz or at ticklish underscore biz. We'd like to thank Cinco Paul for sitting down and talking with us. If Cinco, where are you on the interwebs? Feel free to throw out anything listeners should know about. 
And I'm on Twitter at Syncopedia, C-I-N-C-O-P-E-D-I-A, Instagram there as well, and currently on strike. Go WGA, go SAG. I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Greedy people will be more willing to share the wealth with the people who are making the product. That closes out Ticklish Business for today. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get podcasts. Reviews matter, so consider leaving us one on Apple Podcasts. No less than five stars, please. You can follow us, as always, on Twitter at Ticklish underscore biz, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Ticklish Biz. You can follow me at therap.com, as well as on all social medias at Kristen Lopez 88 Emily Edwards, where are you? I'm still on Twitter and still across social media and trying to build my Instagram just a little bit over at Ms. Emily Edwards. And our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content like our Doubled Features episode on The Women, as well as our upcoming literary adaptations miniseries. So consider helping us out and getting access to all of that at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And of course, me and Emily still have our respective books out. Mine is But Have You Read the Book? 52 Literary Gems That Inspired Our Favorite Films. And Emily's series is the Viviana Valentine Girl Friday Mysteries, which are all excellent. You can order all of those books wherever you buy books. We will return with a new episode on on September 13th, as we mentioned, talking about the 1950s Charles Walters film, High Society. Say well then. <laughs>